and welcome to INSEAD's podcast series, our LeaderCast series. It's a pleasure to welcome today Bernard Lioto, who is the chairman and founder of Business Objects. Uh, he was also the CEO in September 2005. He stepped down from that role to take on the post of Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, Bernard, welcome to INSEAD. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, the the uh, first question I want to ask is, why does a founder uh, and a CEO of a company want to take on an, another or different uh, executive position, uh, as opposed to starting up a different venture, doing more entrepreneurship, which is something that was natural to you, or you know, improving your golf game or, or whatever else? Well, uh, the first thing is that uh, I've always been passionate about the company. I started it, I grew it from all the different phases. So as I saw that uh, there's still a lot of things to do, to me, uh, it seemed uh, a bit inconceivable to leave it completely. So I wanted to stay within the organization. At the same time, I've done this job for, uh, I had done this job for about 15 years. Uh, Business Object is, a, is quite a uh, spread out organization and therefore it requires a lot of work uh, when you're the CEO. It's been a public company for uh, 12 years now. So running a, a very global enterprise is on several continents, uh, you know, doing the, you know, the monthly travel, uh, being subject to the quarterly uh, you know, earnings pressure. After a while, I, I, I thought that uh, A, uh, it would be good for me personally to sort of uh, take a, a bit of a, a step back, uh, change my pace a little bit. At the same time, I think it's good for the company. Uh, you know, a, 15 years is a pretty big uh, number of years to run an organization. And I felt that uh, I, maybe I would help the company better by being more in charge of strategy and bring someone to run the day-to-day. -day. How can you resist, though, getting involved in the CEO work? Uh, because strategy is so close to what the CEO would be doing. How, how do you um, dif differentiate your roles between yourself and the current CEO? That's a good question. It's very hard to resist, actually, but uh, I, I think it starts for, first from a relationship of trust that uh, you build with the, uh, the CEO, which uh, I've done, uh, spent quite some time, and making sure also that uh, it's very clear to the whole uh, team and to the whole company who runs the company, and it's him running the company. He makes all the final decisions. So establishing that clarity is very important. Otherwise, people will get to you all the time and say, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you make that? Uh, but then afterwards, I think it is uh, being a partner, uh, focusing also on the things that have a, a longer time frame. And that's what I do. I try to uh, focus my time on a three-year horizon. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, 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 it relieves me from the quarterly pressure. And at the same time, it's, uh, it's, I think, where the company needs to spend a lot of energy. It's funny to hear you say longer uh, time frame and say three years. Oh, yeah. So for some companies, <laughs> longer time frame. Oil industry, long time frame is 40 years, you know. Mm. Uh, but in your, your industry, three years is a very long time. It's a very long time. Just a bit of background for our viewers. You were, you were the first French software company to be listed uh, in the United States uh, Stock Exchange on the NASDAQ, I believe. Yep, in 1994. Uh, and today, your company is amongst the two dozen or so largest uh, software companies uh, uh, in the world. Um, clearly, when you're when you're that big, you you must have uh, adequate talent coming into the organization. Uh, we talk about a war for talent, but in the software industry, it must be multiplied uh, several fold uh, compared to anything else. Physical capital is is nothing in your industry. Everything is about the human capital. How do you wage this war? Uh, what does business objects do to make sure that you can uh, obtain and then retain the best people that you can? Uh, in this industry? Well, uh, you, you're absolutely right. This is the most important battle that we're fighting every day. So uh, first, uh, it depends on the category of, uh, of, of employees that we're targeting. So in engineering, for instance, you need to uh, give them great projects and so that uh, the engineers feel that they are creating something new, that they're having an impact on the world, that they are uh, working on extremely sophisticated and, uh, and, and great uh, technology. That will have, again, a great visibility afterwards. So it's not about money. It's not about incentive. It's about uh, the, the quality and the, uh, the inspiration based on the project. Uh, so that's important. As we do this, we need to recognize that, uh, and we have recognized that there is a talent war everywhere. So we have spread out uh, our, uh, our fight. And so uh, four years ago, we had 100% of our R&D team in Paris, 400 people all in Paris. Today, we have uh, 16 or 1,700 people in R&D, but we have 400 people in Vancouver, 
We have the same 400 people in Paris, uh, but we have 150 people in Shanghai, 300 people in Bangalore, and a few more people uh, spread out in the U.S. So we have spread uh, our different battles uh, and trying to find people with great talent, uh, but also in, in places where there is more, uh, uh, in a, a bigger pool. Mm -hmm. so, is is yeah. this work integrated, R&D work? Uh, is it, is a, are the units in Vancouver and Bangalore and Shanghai and Paris, are they quite distinct or are they expected to do things that are uh, integrated software projects? Uh, how does it work? Across um, the, uh, well, they have uh, they obviously uh, coordination between the teams, but what we try to do is to have a philosophy of one site, one mission. So you don't have too many uh, you know, cross-site missions because they are very hard to, uh, to coordinate and, and to work on. But what's important also is when, when we build a, a, an engineering team in, in Shanghai, for instance, we don't just give them uh, second-rate uh, projects. Like it's not just about porting the, uh, an existing pro uh, product onto Linux or a, or another uh, or on another operating system. It's about creating new products. So it's about innovating, uh, and so that's how you get the best people. Again, by giving them good jobs. Right, right. In a sense, they're artists, aren't they? Uh, and they want to create. So if you can entice them, uh, if, but with creative projects. Uh, they're more likely to stay. Right. Eventually, you want to take these artists and you want to create them into, into leaders, into people who will develop uh, other artists. Um, how do you do that in business objects? Now, you know, leadership is a massive area. There's so many different characteristics and models of what it takes uh, in a company to succeed as a leader. Are there one or two key characteristics that you think are crucial uh, for a leader within your context, within your uh, company? Well, I have a, a particular philosophy about leadership, which uh, basically relies on three things that I think a leader must be able to do. The first, he needs to define what I call the, the magnetic north, so the direction. Uh, he shouldn't be telling his people exactly what to do. That's uh, management and sometimes micromanagement, but really cl clearly define the direction. Uh, the second thing is that uh, he needs to inspire his people to do things that Otherwise, they wouldn't achieve. So inspire them to do the extraordinary uh, so, uh, so that they feel that, okay, they, they know the direction and they are empowered to do things uh, that they, they wouldn't think about it otherwise. And the third thing for a great leader, in my opinion, is set the example. Uh, if you set the example about the work ethics, about integrity, about um, the way to handle people and sense of humor, uh, everything that are the, the good uh, human qualities, I think that creates a culture throughout the organization. So that's the three things that I'm looking uh, towards when I, when I try to hire a, a leader. Great. Uh, excuse the stereotype, but when I think of uh, people in the software industry, especially the engineers, we think uh, nerdy, technical, over-technical individuals. Um, how do you do some of this? How do you take somebody who's uh, maybe quite technically focused and you make them more into a people person? Maybe you don't do that. Maybe you just, with you know, several hundred, uh, maybe several thousand now individuals to choose from, you can just pluck the right one. Or do you have a development process that helps them you know, break out of one perspective and uh, adapt different behaviors? Yeah, I mean, first we have a development process and we do a lot of training. Uh, about four or four years ago, we sort of shift our training significantly. And before, we were spending a lot of our time on sales training, technical training, uh, all the classic elements uh, that are needed to, uh, to, to, to do software jobs. And, and we've shifted towards leadership training because we realize in the end, uh, we're not working as efficiently as, as we should because we don't have enough uh, true leaders within the organization. So we focused on that. Uh, and I think it, it has paid off. Now, certain people will uh, exert different kinds of, of traits in their leadership. Some are not very good at, uh, at defining a magnetic north, especially in the engineering team, but they can really uh, lead by setting the example. If people see them uh, uh, innovating in particular ways, then that will inspire uh, them uh, to do the same. So you, uh, you inspire by, uh, by creating a particularly maybe iconic innovation. Uh, that's, that's a way you can lead also. You don't, you, you don't necessarily have the management capabilities. And we know that, uh, so we, we create also different tracks in the engineering. So people will be all potentially great leaders, but they will have no management responsibility whatsoever. That's very, uh, very typical, I would say, in the engineering ranks. Okay. Uh, slightly different question. One of the reasons that you're here with us today 
uh, is you're also part of uh, a distinguished group uh, at our leadership summit. And the, the question we have in our, our one-day uh, uh, summit or workshop series uh, is, is Europe still relevant and how can we make it more relevant? Now, uh, when I look at the software industry, uh, I see very few companies that are uh, based in Europe, that are European companies. This seems to be dominated by the United States. Uh, why is that? Uh, why do we have so few uh, major software companies in Europe? Uh, should we be doing something about it? Uh, we should definitely do something about it. To me, uh, it, it's been a real failure. And, and you're right, I think if we take the top 300 software companies, probably about 260 are American. Um, I think only 40 or so are European. And I think three uh, of the top 100 companies are French only. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, we're very behind. And uh, to me, uh, not investing in, uh, and, and not trying to be a leader in the software industry is as if we said you know, 50 years ago, oh, we're not going to do uh, planes, uh, for instance. And uh, I think it's, it's maybe because it's a little bit more immaterial that uh, you know, the nations and, uh, haven't recognized the need to create real programs around it. But I think we have, we have issues today. We don't have the talent pool. Uh, we have great engineers, but we don't have great marketeers. And software is a lot about uh, technical, uh, te technology marketing. We don't really have that uh, capability. We don't have the, uh, you know, the homogeneous home market uh, that has been so important to develop uh, you know, the US industry in software. Uh, we don't have a, cl a center of gravity. You know, Silicon Valley has been a great center of gravity. Which, uh, which, is, which is one which reinvests in itself. And that's the thing that has been a, a key component, I believe, in the success of Silicon Valley, is people create wealth and then they reinject that wealth in other companies. And also, what's happened in the US is that there is sort of a, a clear recipe for success. Everybody does the same thing. They know uh, who the venture capital are, uh, who venture capitalists are, who the, the technology lawyers are, they know how to start a company, they know who the PR companies are. They all follow the same path. In France or in Italy or in the UK, everybody sort of reinvents how you create a, a software organization every time. And I think uh, we need to get to a point where we, uh, uh, we try to establish also sort of a, 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 a similar roadmap for, for these kinds of companies. Sure. Well, in, in your own start was in California with Oracle and, of course, in Silicon Valley. We attended the same school. Um, is there anything similar being developed in Europe? Is there any network or center uh, uh, that's remotely like Silicon Valley where software people, software engineers, uh, co-locate, uh, discuss issues, discuss the industry? Not really. I mean, there's been a, a, a trial with uh, Sophie Antipolis in the south of France around technology in general, uh, but it was a bit too remote. Uh, there's, uh, there was a bit of a technology center, but there was, not, there was no customers or markets really close to it. So I think that has sort of stalled a bit. So to me, it's still quite fragmented. And we still have, you know, in software, there is SAP, there's Dassault Systems, there are Business Objects, Sage, and that's about it, really, in terms of large organization. Okay. Let me turn it back to you. Um, one of the remarkable things to think about becoming a, a, a CEO as a founder is that you had no visible immediate example. Uh, many people, most people who become CEOs go through a company where there is a CEO, uh, or they've been developed through a company like GE, which seems to produce a lot of CEOs for other companies. Uh, and they see firsthand uh, how the chief operating role uh, uh, executive office uh, works. Uh, how did you develop your leadership skills? What was the road like from you uh, between the early 90s and eventually when you went public and then as you grew uh, uh, quite a large and significant software company? Yeah, first of all, it's been a, a learning curve throughout all these years because as the, the company grew very rapidly, we went through very different phases and therefore the, uh, the leadership skills have to change quite a lot. At the beginning, we were just you know, 10 people and it was just about trying to prove the value to a few customers. Then afterwards, when we went public, it was a whole new set of skills to, uh, to try to bring into the organization. So I, I try to evolve uh, as, as quickly as possible as the organization, which is a challenge because in most cases, the organization goes much faster than uh, the CEO. And that's why there are usually changes and it's very rare actually for a founder to stay uh, for very long. I think what I did, uh, which helped me, is that I surrounded myself very well. Uh, 
I hired people who were way better than me, and I was not afraid of, of doing so. I think I realized that if I want to stay the CEO and not be kicked out at some point, I'd better have very strong people working for me. And my job would not be to do their job, uh, but to try to orchestrate as best as possible a, uh, you know, the great talents in engineering, great talents in finance, great talent in marketing. So finding the best possible team and surround myself. And, and sometimes I had to evolve the team. I, I changed the team probably four or five times in a period of, of 17 years. Mm -hmm. And surround myself also on the board. The board was a, a, very, uh, a very important um, uh, group for me to help me grow. And, uh, and the third point is you have to listen. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're too focused on, on your own points of view, because it, uh, since I didn't have any experience, I could not uh, really argue that I had all the right ideas about things, uh, or I'd be naturally, in intuitively good, but it doesn't really uh, happen. So you have to listen. Uh, and that's what I try to do, uh, maybe uh, you bring a little bit of humility uh, to this whole exercise, uh, surround myself with great people, uh, management team, board, and listening skills. The, the board comment is very insightful. Did your board stay mostly intact over the years? Have you had a lot of uh, changes on the board? Not a lot of changes, but uh, a few changes. I mean, there, there's still one, per there's one person who has been here uh, during the whole uh, time for 17 years, who's still with us. Uh, then there's been some turnover, but I have some board members who've been uh, with us for nine years or so. But initially, uh, I had on my board um, venture capitalists. So once we went public, uh, they left. I brought in independent board members, and I try to build a, a group that that brings different perspectives, and are ready to challenge, uh, to challenge me, to challenge the team, and that worked out pretty well. Great, Bernard. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.